Good morning, First Congregational Church. Uh, friends and guests, I'm Jonathan Goodell. I'm speaking from my home in Winchester. We're not ready just yet to go back to the why. So walking is one of the things that Betsy and I like to do each morning. We walk around Horn Pond and there's something about that daily routine that is reassuring and anchors our day. It's paced pretty well. It gives us time to check in with each other. We've come to expect some of our, our curious um, walking companions, people we see each time, the, the guy with the clanking lopsided gait, carrying his golf bags as part of his training, and the three guys with that black cockapoo with the white face that almost seems to be smiling. And wait, one morning, there were two women walking the same dog going the other way, perhaps a COVID pod. And some mornings I'm leading the way, and some mornings I need my cup of coffee to keep up with Betsy's ambitious steps. And the loop has its moods. There's the arching oak section of the walk, and then there's the back loop, which is wetlands and sandy soil, where we have to put our masks on every time someone comes by. But what I love about this walk is that when our conversation becomes a little too knotted up, there's always a whiff of something fresh, maybe a view of the swans and their teenage children, a park bench, a memorial plaque, something that gets us out of our tightly wound world. Well, last week, Betsy and I did something different. She had been listening to a podcast on walking and prayer based on the Camino pilgrimage in Northern Spain. She wanted me to hear it. She said, take my phone and why don't you go that way and I'll go this way. So there we were deep in thought, passing each other on the other side of the pond. And maybe it was that podcast that got me thinking about walking and living out of a suitcase or a camel bag or a dusty knapsack, because I think our passage today, if it doesn't celebrate that, it puts it in front of us as a spiritual tool or discipline. Of course, our passage today will begin a 40 year journey for the people of Israel. Everything has been knocked loose by plague, by political upheaval. And this tribal people is being given this small, narrow space to escape and to develop into a people no longer enslaved. They're being offered spiritual freedom. And the cornerstone of that freedom seems to be, among other things, this idea that they need to pack their bags. Here's the the section that Lynn just read. This is how you shall eat the Passover lamb, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. So I'd like to imagine for a minute Thanksgiving celebrated this way. Just imagine you're at the tender age of 15 you come well prepared with your iPad, with some games, maybe with a book you have to read for Monday's class. You start to settle down. And suddenly there's the call for the, you know, the, the turkey's ready. You know, the turkey's come out of the oven. These amazing side dishes that are there only once a year come out. And your mom's famous rolls come warm to the table. And just when you're ready to sit down, you hear, Okay, everyone, get your coats on. Would someone crack the door? And the cold November wind blows in. And Aunt Martha says, and she's been slaving over this turkey all day. Okay, eat up. We have just a few minutes before we have to get going. It's, it runs against human nature, against the grain, to not settle in and take comfort from the food we're enjoying. 
But the message of the Passover in this passage is this. God is on the move. Are you going to keep up? Are you going to walk ahead? Are you going to put your coat on? Are you going to stay back and do whatever feels most comfortable to you? I like to remind myself that walking and this kind of journey is very much a part of our story, our, our faith story. So in Genesis 12, Abram and Sarai take to the road without a road map. And then as we heard last week, Moses takes off his hot, hot, dusty sandals by a burning bush and is invited to go back to proud Egypt and the Pharaoh and proclaim freedom for his people. And now this passage reminds the people of Israel, the people of Abram and Sarai, that they are about to start a difficult journey, which at times will be so difficult that they will wish they were back enslaved in Egypt, but they're being given the beauty of a walk out in hope, a walk without a roadmap. Now I'd like to go back to this podcast I listened to and this Christian idea of walking with God, walking as a pilgrim. Like the people of Israel, we're invited to greet our strange journey through pandemic as pilgrims. Let's think about what a pilgrim does. A pilgrim sets out with a minimum of material goods. This is not a journey about the luxuries of life. This is a chance to walk with as little as is needed. The pilgrim will find hospitality from humble and kind hearts along the way. The pilgrim strips away distraction in order to be more alive to what's going on. Our pilgrim creates space or submits to the space around her, around him, around them. And our Passover text is not the end of an ordeal. It's the beginning of a refining journey that will shape a whole nation. A history of terrible abuse will be sorted and sifted, clarified and resolved around the journey itself, but also around law and around a hovering holy God whom the nation begins to trust as a presence that wants the best for them. It will not be easy, but it will be a journey toward a greater peace, stability, freedom, and joy. I have to kind of laugh thinking back to March and the kinds of thoughts and solutions and things I was thinking about as the pandemic began to break open. I think, I think this six month journey so far has whittled away at optimism and our desire to be in charge and to plan. And it's helped us to settle back and to take the road as it comes. There's this interesting saying that says, not all who wander are lost. And perhaps that's what we're doing. We're wandering, but as pilgrims, pilgrims who are lifted up by the journey of thousands and thousands of others who've walked the same path, who've gone the same way. So let's go back. As I was walking with that, with that voice in my ear, that podcast, I was being invited to breathe deeply and set my breath and my steps in relationship to each other. And after that, I found I was looking you know, up at the canopy of the trees and not just down at the steps and the destination and the goal. My eyes traveled out to the water. I noticed more detail, more life around me. And I was especially impressed with the pilgrim practice of picking up a stone, putting it in my pocket and remembering something about the earth that I'm carrying, a concern, a challenge, something that grounds me and puts me in touch with 
with God and my need to be in touch with God and with others. Well, whatever your work this fall, I believe we can bring a pilgrim awareness to it. I'm aware that for me as a pilgrim, it starts with simplicity, a small pack and a simple tuning to voices around and within. I hope to keep my breathing and my footsteps aligned. And like the Camino pilgrims, I will be carrying a rock in my pocket to remind me of my frailty, of heartache in my life, and of my impulse to speak way ahead of my ability to act. But I will also, especially, remember that I'm walking this road with others. As Judy reminded us, we're eating together to discover the community we, we share. And if we have our bags packed and ready to go, I believe our meal leads us not so much to each other as it does out into the world, into mission and into God's heart. So I wish for you that strange, curious experience of being so aware that others have walked the same road. And may we walk it together as we set our hearts towards whatever the fall brings. Amen. Amen. Feel